Okay, um, welcome everybody. Uh, my name's uh, Kevin Kerrigan uh, and I'm the uh, Dean of Northumbria uh, Law School and I'm delighted to welcome uh, you all here to this, the second of our Eldon Lecture Series for this academic year. Um, if you haven't already got one, you might want to pick up from outside one of the uh, brochures about the, uh, the Eldon Lecture Series uh, and you'll see that um, coming up, um, later, um, well, in, on the 1st of December, we've got the uh, Solicitor General, Edward Garnier QC, who will be talking about uh, pro bono uh, legal advice, giving something back. And a week later, we've got Lucy Scott Moncrief, uh, Vice President of the Law Society, looking at what shall we do without legal aid. Uh, and then... In January, we've got uh, Shami Chakrabarti, January the uh, 26th, Shami Chakrabarti uh, from Liberty, uh, coming to talk about uh, common values, the state of rights and freedoms in coalition Britain. And there are, there are other highlights, again, uh, further through the year, but that just gives you a taste of what's to come in the next month or so. Um, but back to uh, this evening, and uh, it's, a, it's a delight for me to, uh, to welcome to the law school uh, Mr Andrew Keogh, um, to deliver this, which is the second in, in the series. And uh, following Andrew's talk, which he assures me will last no more than an hour, um, uh, he, uh, he's willing to uh, take questions, um, and also there'll be an opportunity uh, for light refreshments outside in the, in the foyer. Uh, and there will be wine and soft drinks for people uh, if they would like to join us there for a drink afterwards. Um, <laughs> a little bit about Andrew... Andrew is a well-known figure in the world of, of criminal litigation and, uh, and legal practice. He first qualified as a barrister, uh, being called by Inner Temple in 1994, uh, before seeing the error of his ways and cross-qualifying as a solicitor uh, and working for a number of solicitors' firms, uh, including Tucker's, uh, which is where he currently practices from in Manchester. Um, in 2002, he started Crimeline, uh, which um, is uh, a company that's been described as the uh, leading provider of knowledge and training for criminal law professionals. And that's how many of you may know uh, of him through the regular um, updates that you might receive uh, via uh, the Crimeline uh, web service. Um, Andrew is a notable uh, author um, and has uh, either written or contributed to no less than Ten books, including uh, Blackstone's Criminal Practice um, and the very popular Magistrates' Court's Handbook. He's also the Associate Editor um, Legal at the Journal of Forensic and Legal Medicine. Um, he is currently the Chief Assessor uh, for Criminal Litigation for the Criminal Litigation Accreditation Scheme at the Law Society of England and Wales. Uh, but perhaps most importantly, um, Andrew is. Uh, currently, because he accepted in 2010 an invitation to become a visiting fellow at, uh, at this law school at the University of Northumbria. Um, it therefore gives me a great pleasure to welcome Andrew here this evening uh, to talk about his theme, which is criminal case management, uh, and the answer the, to the question, is the game over? Andrew. Kevin, thank you. Distinguished guests, it's an absolute great pleasure to be here this evening to present a lecture as part of the university's uh, Eldon Lecture Series. I want to talk today uh, about a topic which is really taking over everyone's mind in criminal litigation at the moment, uh, and it's one of criminal case management. Um, what I want to do, though, is just take you a little bit into the future. Let, let, let's leave tonight and let's just forward fast, not too far, but I want you to, to take you to the 1st of January 2012. And this is the story on that date. Sad news has reached us. It is my rather sombre duty to inform you of the death of one of this country's great lawyers. She served the criminal justice system with great distinction over a great many years. Her style being praised across the world as being consistent with the very best defence practices. She had an attention to detail that saw every point, however minor, exploited to the greatest advantage on behalf of her client. Acquittal after acquittal followed, and clients soon flocked. She had a fantastic practice 
by any measure. They flocked so they too could have the benefit of her great skill. To some in the room, her death will be no great surprise. <coughs> Illness first struck in 2003, but it was a skirmish she survived on occasions rallying to her former greatness over the intervening years. But alas, finally exhausted of her energies, she has now lost the fight. She is, ladies and gentlemen, or perhaps she was, the clever technical lawyer. The news for today, the 1st of January 2012, the clever technical lawyer is now officially dead. Let's go back to today and let's examine that. And let's perhaps begin the post-mortem and begin to examine the cause, or perhaps more accurately, the causes of death. We go back quite a long time in criminal litigation history. We go back a decade to Lord Justice Old, as he now is. He produced a seminal report into the process of criminal litigation. The report was incredibly wide-ranging. It impacted and touched upon every part of the criminal process, beginning with investigation and charge and how that might be performed, going through pre-trial, trial, magistrates, Crown Court and disposal on appeal. But one of the topics touched upon by his Lordship, not surprisingly, was that of case management. And it shouldn't have been a surprise because in many respects Lord Justice Old was replicating work for which there was already a precedent, a precedent set some years earlier by Lord Justice Wolfe and his report into the civil procedure rules and the Wolfe report which followed and the changes which had begun probably four or five years earlier. Wolfe had carried out that task quite unusually in my view with almost critical acclaim. There were a few dissenters along the way as, as there will be when there's any process of change. But by and large, what Wolfe achieved in an incredibly short period of time, whether right or wrong, we don't need to get into that, but he achieved in a very short space of time a seismic change in the way litigation was carried out in the civil courts. And one suspects that Old was looking for the same seismic shift. The reforms in civil procedure are not over. It's a very topical issue at the moment. Lord Justice Jackson, published a very important speech just two days ago on the topic, but no one would dispute there had been a revolution in the civil courts. Normally, if you just take a quote here, an extract there, you don't really do justice to a piece of work the size of Lord Justice Old's report. But I think if I take one quote, there's some merit in saying that it does do justice. This is what he actually wrote. To the extent that the prosecution may legitimately wish to fill possible holes in its case once issues have been identified by the defence statement, it is understandable why, as a matter of tactics, a defendant might prefer to keep his case close to his chest. But that is not a valid reason for preventing a full and fair hearing on the issues canvassed at the trial. A criminal trial is not a game under which a guilty defendant should be provided with a sporting chance. It is a search for truth in accordance with the twin principles that the prosecution must prove its case and that a defendant is not obliged to inculpate himself, the object being to convict the guilty and acquit the innocent. Requiring a defendant to indicate in advance what he disputes about the prosecution case offends neither of those principles. Okay, but why should that cause a stir? Well, at first it caused absolutely no stir at all. Royal Commission reports are seldom high on the bedtime reading list and lawyers, by and large, continued business as before. A business-as-usual approach could not, however, be faulted in this particular case as the lawyers were taught to behave in the way they were behaving. It was very heavily ingrained in the teachings of the criminal profession. However influential the report may have been, it lacked authority in both statute and common law. Until perhaps 2003, when one particular barrister had the misfortune to land himself before the Court of Appeal, and in what might have been a fluke of listing, but may have been something altogether more calculated, he found himself in front of Lord Justice Old. 
The case was Gleason, and Gleason was a classic technical defence case. What had happened in Gleason is that counsel had spotted a technical fault with the indictment. It was quite clear, and arguably counsel was correct, although the academics are split somewhat on this, it was arguably correct that the prosecution couldn't prove its case. So what did counsel decide to do? Counsel decided to sit on his hands, say nothing, don't cross-examine any witnesses, and at half-time stand up and say, Your Honour, there is no case to answer. That's what counsel did. That's the submission counsel made, and that submission was upheld by the judge. Did that secure this wonderful victory for Gleeson, who, to be honest, probably hadn't a clue what was going on? Anybody who pretends this was the act of Gleeson would be in error. This was the act of counsel, make no mistake about that. So what happened next? Well, the prosecution made an application to amend the indictment, to cure the defect. That application was granted, and the trial was to continue. You see the problem here, though, because now the trial's running, and there was a defence to be put. There were lines which had the indictment started at the beginning in its now amended form, there are lines of inquiry which would have been put to the witnesses in cross-examination. So what did counsel do? Counsel made an application to discharge the jury. The cunning plan had now fallen apart, so counsel now wanted to rewrite history, begin again, and put his case the way he would have put it in a perfect world. That application was declined, Gleeson was convicted, and off Gleeson went to the Court of Appeal to seek a remedy. Perhaps the best way to sum it up is to read to you what James Richardson, QC, the distinguished editor of Archbold, wrote in Criminal Law Week at the time, in quite a scathing review of the case. He said this, As in this case, an advocate should know that technical points with little or no substantive merit may be met by an application for an adjournment to obtain vital missing evidence, to recall a witness, to deal with a vital point, to reopen the prosecution case, or to amend the indictment or the charge, etc. And they should also know that in the event of complete success on a technical point on one charge, there is always a possibility of a fresh set of proceedings on another charge. The more technical the point is, the more likely that one or other of the prosecution applications will be allowed, a consideration that must weigh heavily in the balance in favour of early disclosure. The defence advocate who alerts his opponent is in a much stronger position to resist the subsequent application to amend, adjourn, etc., if notwithstanding the warning the prosecution had proceeded on their original course. The Court of Appeal dismissed the appeal and did so using these particular words. For defence advocates to seek to take advantage of such errors by deliberately delaying identification of an issue of fact or law in the case until the last possible moment is, in our view, no longer acceptable. Given the legislative and procedural changes to our criminal justice process in recent years, indeed we consider it to be contrary to the requirement on an accused in Section 5.6 of the 1996 Act, and what that's talking about is in relation to defence statement, and in particular paragraph B, to indicate the matters on which he takes issue with the prosecution. That section has been subsequently amended, but that's still the general gist of it. And to their professional duty to the court, and not in the legitimate interests of the defendant. It's worth noting that at this point in time, most professionals believed that a defence statement related solely to issues of disclosure. Back in 2003-2004, we use the language of primary disclosure and secondary disclosure. And most people were of the view that if you were not seeking secondary disclosure, then what was the point of a defence statement? That is an analysis of the 1996 Act, which is incorrect, but it's an analysis of that Act which still holds quite strong in some quarters today. Whatever the understanding of the 96 Act, no advocate could be in much doubt after Gleeson that the game had changed or was beginning to change. For the first time, the court also alluded to the advocate's professional duty 
implying that the old method of conducting litigation might well be contrary to conduct rules. And this was a very, very significant development in my view. Because very often, playing the game was considered not only a noble art of litigation, but if it went wrong, it was one of those things. You play hard, you lose hard, hey-ho, you get away with some things, you don't with others. No one had previously ever canvassed the idea that by playing the game, not only were you doing something which might not secure a win, but in fact you might have been doing something which was in fact unprofessional. And I think that was an alarming proposition to many people. You might have expected after that 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 would have sounded as a wake-up call across the professions. The problem, however, was that this was not an evolutionary change to the rules, but a revolutionary one. In New Law Journal at the time, a short time after the case of Gleeson, I wrote, for my part, I sense a genuine confusion on the part of advocates as to what their exact duties are in an adversarial system. And the surprising thing, the regrettable thing in my view, is that there was no debate to be had about this anywhere. This was being presented by the judiciary at the very highest levels as a completed act. No one was inviting discussion. It was a change. It had been implemented. And that was it. You got on with it. What it left, though, were perhaps more questions unanswered. We had the almost irreconcilable conflict, or what seemed to be an irreconcilable conflict, between a lawyer's duty to his or her client and the lawyer's duty to the court. That, that is a debate in itself, and for those of you interested, Professor Ed Cape wrote an article some time back in Legal Ethics, which I think is the only academic work to date which tried to look at some of these conflicting obligations and duties to see how the circle might be squared. So given that Gleeson was quite decisive in what the judiciary wanted, given that it had not only said, boys and girls, this is no longer acceptable, but it had actually gone one step further and said it's not only unacceptable, it's actually unprofessional to act in that way, did the message get across to the barristers and solicitors? The very simple answer to that is no. And the evidence for that is to be found in a very, very, very long line of cases. Many in relation to road traffic matters, which lend themselves very well to technical points, but also in other matters along the way. So what have we got? We started off with old, a Royal Commission report. It lacked authority, the old report. It lacked the authority of common law or statute. Well, common law has now spoken. The judges have spoken. But what about Parliament? What did Parliament have to say? Had Parliament done enough in the 1996 Act? Clearly not. But Parliament had laid the foundations for what was going to come next. An incredibly important Act of Parliament, but little spoken about amongst lawyers, was the Courts Act of 2003. Important in so many ways. But one of the very important provisions in that Act was the foundation for the criminal procedure rules. And 2005 is where we see the next significant development in criminal case management, the criminal procedure rules 2005. Many at the time, including myself, dismissed them as a mere gimmick. They wouldn't last the winter. They were a bit like street crime courts and things like that. These things come along every now and again. They occupy our attention, and then everybody forgets about them, and we just go back to business as usual and get on with it. And I, and I think I was in good company, believed the criminal procedure rules would die a very quick and miserable death and not really bother us too much. So, did they survive, or did they die this miserable death? Oh, oh they survived all right. Um, we don't have the criminal procedure rules 2005 anymore. We're in the third reincarnation of the beast. They're now the criminal procedure rules 2011. And in fact, it won't be long before the ink's dried. We'll have the criminal procedure rules 2012. And I think we're going to see some amendments pretty soon to deal with new sending provisions under the Criminal Justice Act 2003. The fact that the rule book has not lain dormant over the last six years 
gives us a very clear insight into the importance that the judiciary at the highest level attached to the criminal procedure rules. And what is quite striking about the rules is that they are judiciary-led. The Criminal Procedure Rules Committee is the usual assembly of the great and good. It has all the people you would expect on it. Lord Chief Justice, senior this, senior that, senior the other, <coughs> representative from this, that and the other. But it hasn't abdicated its responsibility. The work product of the Criminal Procedure Rules Committee is very much lawyer, judiciary-led. And that is very striking about it. So what we see is a Criminal Procedure rule book which is alive, it's dynamic, it's refreshed at great interval. It is truly a living instrument of the judiciary's intention as far as criminal case management is concerned. The criminal procedure will span hundreds of pages, much of it really of insignificance to day-to-day -day practice. They're engaged every now and again and it covers such an array of topics. But there are two parts of the rules which are of everyday importance, no matter whether you're in the Magistrates' Court or the Crown Court. Part one, the overriding objective, and part three, case management. And these are little understood, and probably the reason for that is very few lawyers would actually have read the rules, and this is one of the problems. What does the overriding objective say? The overriding objective of this new code is that criminal cases be dealt with justly. Dealing with a criminal case justly includes acquitting the innocent and convicting the guilty, dealing with the prosecution and defence fairly, recognising the rights of a defendant, particularly those under Article 6 of the Convention, respecting the interests of witnesses, victims and jurors, and keeping them informed of the progress of the case, dealing with the case efficiently and expeditiously, ensuring that appropriate information is available, etc., etc. Rule 1.2 is quite striking. The duty of the participants in a criminal case, each participant in the conduct of each case, must... You notice the language. Okay? There's no discretion here. Crystal clear. There's no debate about this. Must. Nothing to argue about. The participants must prepare and conduct the case in accordance with the overriding objective. Comply with these rules practice directions and directions made by the court and inform the court and parties of procedural failure. When we go to case management, to give you a flavour, in Rule 3.2, the duty of the court, this causes confusion because advocates seem to think it's nothing to do with them because they don't read on to 3.3. The duty of the court, active case management. And what does that mean? What well, it tells you the early identification of the real issues, and again, the word's quite important, the real issues in the case, the early identification of the needs of witnesses, achieving certainty as to what must be done, by whom and when, in particular by the early setting of a timetable for the progress of the case, monitoring the progress of the case, ensuring the evidence, whether disputed or not, is presented in the shortest and clearest way, discouraging delay, dealing with as many aspects of the case as possible on the same occasion and avoiding unnecessary hearings, encouraging the participants to cooperate in the progression of the case and making use of technology. The court must actively manage the case by giving any direction appropriate to the needs of that case as early as possible. This has caused confusion because the heading is the duty of the court. But what does 3.3 say? In fulfilling its duty under Rule 3.2, the court may give any directions, and each party must a. actively assist the court in fulfilling its duty under Rule 3.2, without, or if necessary, with a direction. Again, consider the wording. Actively assist the court fulfilling its duty of case management, without, or if necessary, with a direction. It's a proactive duty. It's not something which only comes into play when a member of the judiciary decides to engage it or the advocate and apply for a direction if needed to further the overriding objective. The rules go on and on, case preparation and conduct of trial and appeal.
but the flavour is the same. So now, in 2005, for the very first time, the rule book of criminal litigation was laid out. And whatever the criticisms might be of the criminal procedure rules, the one thing they actually don't lack, surprisingly, for such a significant sized beast of a rule book is clarity. They're very simple, they're very straightforward, they're incredibly clear. So there shouldn't really be much confusion. You would have thought, therefore, that with this rule book, the message was intended to be the game has changed. Get over it and get on with it. Where's the doubt anymore as to the future of criminal litigation? But in reality, from 2005, little if anything changed on the ground. And the reason was change brought about by a rule here, a case there, is insufficient in my view to bring about such seismic change. What you did not get with the criminal procedure rules was the same noise that surrounded the arrival of the civil procedure rules. The same buzz was simply not present as far as criminal litigation was concerned. And for all intents and purposes, what we've had over the last six years is six lost years. So be due to the inability of the judiciary, whose project it is, to properly engage the professions. Whether the judiciary would agree with that analysis, with or without the benefit of hindsight, I know not. The cases over those intervening years from 2005 to 2011 are almost too great a number to mention. A lot of road traffic cases, but a lot of others. But they do, in the main, have two very striking features. One, that the old game is still being played, which might be a surprise. And second, that the players involved in the cases were, in the main, but not entirely, but in the main, oblivious to the fact the rules had changed in the first place. What they were doing was what they still believed was what was expected of them and permitted. The idea that what they were doing was against the rules and could be tantamount to behaviour which would bring a professional into disrepute was not even entertained in their minds. And that is due, quite simply, to a fundamental failure in communication between those people who wanted the change to be brought about and the 10, 15,000 or so practitioners whose job it is to actually do it on a day-to-day -day basis. So what had been going on? What were the crimes being committed by advocates up and down the land? Well, there's many, but these are the main themes. Forcing witnesses to court simply to see whether they'll turn up. Very often this is done in a domestic violence context, and I'll come back to that later. But it's done in lots of other contexts as well. If you have an analyst coming from a laboratory 150 miles away, what are the chances of them coming to a magistrate's court? You don't know. But there's actually a third chance they won't get there, you know, because there's communication that breaks down, there's motorway networks that get snarled up, cases get adjourned. In fact, if you want to bring an analyst from a laboratory in Huntingdon to talk about a firearm or a blood sample and talk about continuity, there's actually a third chance that person won't turn up. That's the reality of it. Arguing continuity points when evidence itself is not in dispute. It, it's all very well saying, well, how do I know that's the blood sample that was taken from John Smith at Newcastle Police Station at 3 a.m. in the morning? Well, it's one hell of a coincidence if it's not. Might really be the answer to that. Okay? Is the issue with the blood sample or is it not? Continuity arguments, right for causing a little bit of mischief. Failing to agree evidence not in dispute. Failing to agree the true issues in a case. Seeking disclosure of evidence above and beyond the statutory obligation. And failing to point out technical deficiencies in the prosecution case. We can actually conveniently describe this behaviour of the defence community because, with some irony, they're actually trying 
to achieve the overriding objective. But it's a different overriding objective to the one in the rules. This time, they're trying to achieve the client's overriding objective. And the client's overriding objective is much more clearly articulated. He only has one objective generally, and that's to get off. And this is what lawyers believed they could do. And it was interesting because we all knew there were lines. And a client will very often come up to me and say, Mr. Keir, what, what do you think I should do? And I say, I think you should... <clears throat> and sort of this speech bubble appears above my head. And if the client could see it, it would say, I think you should do what Forrest Gump did. You should run and keep on running. It never ceases to amaze me how many people turn up on bail to get a sentence of 10 years in the Crown Court. That baffles me that people do it. And they say, what do you think will happen? And I say, well, good grief away, mate. You just, you just never know. You know. And I've already endorsed 10 years on the back of the brief. And then when he gets sent, you say, oh, God, bad luck that, mate. Yeah, didn't know he was going to be his honour Judge Grumpy this morning. Sorry about that. Yeah, it happens. It happens, you know. So we can't do some things. We can't tell a client to skip bail, even if that is the best advice, because it's encouraging a criminal act. But can you tell a client to disobey a rule? Why might you want to do that? Well, there are lots of reasons you might not want to tell someone early on what your defence is, because you can predict that that defence is a pack of lies which is going to land the person in water later on. So you might want to keep your cards back. It's playing the game. If the defendant's saying, I've never been to that house, okay, that causes some problems when the DNA comes at the side of the television stand. And then the defence changes, ah, yes, well, I remember now. You know, well, you know, more people get convicted on the lie than on primary evidence. So this was considered tactics. And what we needed to debate was whether you were permitted or not to have a tactical discussion with your client. Well, we'll see what the courts make of that in a little moment. So what we have now, though, three planks in place. We have Old's intention, we have his framework, the grand plan. We have Parliament speaking through the 96 Act, but more importantly the 2003 Act, which provided the framework for the criminal procedurals. And we have the common law engaged, we have the higher judiciary at the High Court and the Court of Appeal applying this in quite a robust way. There's perhaps no better time than now for this discussion. Because over the last seven weeks or so, and continuing for a few more weeks yet, almost 30,000 magistrates and district judges are being trained on a new initiative called Stop Delaying Justice. Before I explain that in some more detail, I think there are a few points which illustrate what this is all about. The first is this, the antecedent history of the authors of that training package. What do I mean by that? Well, this package has been authored in the main by district judges. And it's been authored in the main by district judges who in a previous existence were defence lawyers. Poachers turned gamekeepers. And, and, and the training package oozes this. It absolutely oozes it from every pore. You can see what's happening in relation to this. They acknowledge quite candidly, and this is refreshing, what went on before was acceptable. And that is very interesting. They say, yes, that, that's what we did. And we did it with pride. And that was allowed. And we did it. But it's not allowed anymore, so stop doing it. But it is quite refreshing that it's actually been said. Okay? So credit for that. They have a robust stance that the practice which went before is no longer acceptable. The rules have changed. Get on with it. Move on. The past is the past. The training is across the entire lower court judiciary. The size of the training exercise to train nearly 30,000 people in 12 weeks it, it, it is an absolute phenomenal training task. Its ambition knows hardly any bounds. It has a clear implementation date. Ah, well, <laughs> it, it was meant to have a clear implementation date, which was the 1st of January 2012. But what you'll find is the implementation date is a day after the magistrates have been trained, trained on it. So it's quite a shock to some. Defence will have 
they don't at the moment, but will have access to the training package. And it's interesting because it explains the genesis of what's going on. So you'll see clearly what the judiciary wants to achieve here. It's arguable as to whether this amounts to little more than a temporary diversion away from business as usual or a coup d'etat that delivers a coup de grace to the old world order. We'll see on the 1st of January. So what can we expect to happen in the lower courts the day after your magistrates have been trained? Well, we can take a number of topics. Firstly, the case management form. The number one thing which irritates everybody in the system. The rules are crystal clear. It must be completed. The rules are crystal clear. Case management must be dealt with and dealt with properly and at the first hearing. No ids, no buts. The case management form is really analogous to the position in the Crown Court as far as the defence statement is concerned. And what we can do, we can look at case law in relation to the defence statement and we can see what we're meant to do with the case management form. And the case which perhaps deals with this best, although there's a variety, is the case of Rochford from 2010. The citation, if you're interested, it, the neutral citation, 2010, England and Wales Court of Appeal, criminal, 1928. And in Rochford, it said this, there is a statutory obligation to file a defence statement. I would read that as there is a statutory obligation within the criminal procedure rules to in a contested matter, complete a case management form. And in addition, there are statutory consequences if one does not. Less clear on that, but I'll come back to that in a moment. We accept counsel's submission that counsel, or for that matter a solicitor or other legal advisor, cannot properly advise a defendant to disobey the statutory duty. He can, of course, advise the defendant what his obligation is. What he must put in his defence statement, which in turn depends upon how the trial is going to be conducted. And he must advise him of the consequences of not doing so. If the rule were different, we observe in passing that it would be open to any defendant at trial who had failed to file a defence statement to put in evidence the fact that it had been on advice and in consequence to submit that there should be no adverse comment. In effect, that would render the rules of no effect at all. The remaining question is this, what is the duty of the lawyer if the defendant has no positive case to advance at trial but declines to plead guilty? They said this, this is a realistic if rare practical possibility. Well, it is quite rare in the Crown Court, but in fact in the Magistrates Court it is much more common, particularly on the classic domestic violence case where she doesn't want to come to court anymore because Love's Young Dream is back on track and therefore he wants to secure an acquittal by achieving the objective of forcing a trial and her not turning up and no evidence being offered. I'll come back to that in a moment. They say it may occur in at least two situations. It might happen that a defendant within the cloak of privilege confides in his lawyer that he is in fact guilty of the offence but refuses to plead guilty. He cannot be prevented from taking that course and his instructions to his lawyer are covered by privilege. He is entitled in those circumstances to sit through the trial and to see whether the Crown can prove the case or not. But what he is not entitled to do is conduct the trial by putting in issue of specific matters and advancing either evidence or argument towards them without giving notice in his defence statement that he is going to do it. So if you're putting the Crown to proof, that's exactly what you do. You say nothing apart from an element or elements of this offence are not made out on the prosecution case brought forward. Any other shenanigans would be outside of that and you would be prevented from advancing that argument at trial. Later on in the judgment is perhaps one of the most remarkable things ever written in a criminal judgment. And the court says this. Accordingly, in all those circumstances, the lawyer's duty is first of all never to advise either the absence of a defence statement or the omission from it of something which the section requires because of the way the trial is going to be conducted. So now you're not able to say to a client, you must do this, but in fact you could choose not to and there might be benefits from not doing it. That, that's a discussion which is actually forbidden 
you have to simply give the party line. These are the obligations, these are the consequences of not following it. You can't give tactical advice on what to do. And they say this, the lawyer's duty is not to give the defendant advice on what to do. The de lawyer's duty is to explain the statutory obligation that he has and to explain the consequences which follow from disobedience. So once again here we have very clear professional conduct issues because the reality is it is almost inconceivable, in my opinion, that a client would ever walk into a solicitor's office and say, Mr Keogh, I've been reading me Archibald and I've been considering this friction between your duties to me on the one hand and duties to the court on the other. They seem irreconcilable and therefore I've decided not to further the court's overriding objective and therefore I won't play ball. That is not a conversation any defence lawyer is ever going to have with a client. Okay? Therefore, any obstruction of these rules is simply and clearly, and this would be known to any district judge, and I think any lay magistrate as well, would actually be at the behest of the lawyer. It would not be the client's own thinking. So what happens if there is obstruction? Well, we see what happens now. If the lawyer won't cooperate, we can't really go very far into the discussion of this because we do now start delving into issues of legal privilege. So what judges now do, and district judges are much better at this at the moment than lay magistrates, but lay magistrates do have the assistance of legal advisers, the district judge will cut out the lawyer from the equation and go straight to the horse's mouth and the dock and have the discussion. And lo and behold, what do you get? You get the answers to the questions you want. There are no issues of privilege. And in fact, the issues, more often than not, are very, very simple and straightforward. It proves what is happening. It's the lawyer obstructing what's going on. But what about these things that might be said to stand in the way? What about legal privilege? What about self-incrimination? Non-issues. Simple as that. Why can we be bullish about that? Because we've been there and we've done that in case law. There are no issues of legal privilege as far as inquiring as to what the line of defence is. Whether you agree or disagree with that is really quite irrelevant because that is what the High Court and the Court Appeal have ruled time after time after time. The debate is over. As far as self-incrimination is concerned, well of course, and we'll see an example of this in a moment in relation to the case of Firth, it might be said in the ordinary meaning of the phrase, that to give any concession as to the case might impinge on self-incrimination. So, for example, if you're saying, well, the issue in this case is self-defence, then you are implicit in that, admitting carrying out the assault. The issue to be tried is therefore not whether an assault was actually inflicted, but whether it was a lawful or an unlawful assault. But, of course, you're making a concession of the assault, and you might be depriving yourself of a line of inquiry. But does it infringe self-incrimination within the meaning of Article 6, which you'll remember must be preserved under the criminal procedurals? Well, the answer to that is not. And if you look at the case law, perhaps the best example is the case of Francis O'Halloran, which was the 172 driving case. Francis O'Halloran, having been required to identify the driver of the vehicle, claimed it impacted upon self-incrimination. Why was that rejected? by the court? Well, for lots of reasons. There are, there are very powerful public policy reasons in relation to uh, road policing. But the key issue in Article 6 was that was not enough to convict. So it wasn't equivalent to the old line of cases, the Ernest Saunders and the Guinness litigation from years ago. Not only did you have to prove who the driver was, but of course you had to prove they were doing something illegal on the road, so speeding or whatever. So there are no issues of legal privilege and there are no issues of self-incrimination. Therefore, whatever the liking or not of what's happening at the moment, it seems to me that the approach is now, within the framework of English law, crystal clear. The rules were dealt a bit of a blow earlier in the year with the case of Firth and Epping justices. What happened in this case? Miss Firth assaulted someone on a train. I can say this now because she later pleaded guilty. She assaulted someone on a train. She was charged with common assault, appeared before Epping Magistrates Court, represented by counsel, but nothing turns upon that. Pleaded not guilty, and on the case management form, when asked to identify the issues, 
wrote words to the effect self-defence. The only contact the defendant had with the complainant was in self-defence. The case went off for trial. The injuries transpired to be much more serious, so the Crown decided to proceed on a Section 47 actual bodily harm charge, and the matter was making its way to the Crown Court. Matter adjourned for committal. CPS served the papers, and the lawyers spotted that the CPS had not established on the papers that Firth was actually responsible for assaulting anybody. That was an omission, quite a glaring omission, I think. So they asked for an old-style readout committal under Section 6.1 of the 1980 Act. They turned up and said, no, 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 there's no evidence that Firth assaulted anybody. And the Justice's legal advisor said, well, yes, there is, because on this form, there's effectively an admission of an assault. You say the issue here is self-defence. So implicit in that, Miss Firth must accept having assaulted this person. This is revolutionary. We don't expect this kind of shenanigans as defence lawyers. And it comes as no surprise whatsoever to me that this 6-1 committal was asked for. So the magistrates committed the case and Firth went running to the High Court. The High Court held that the form was admissible. Why? Because it's a preserved common law exception to hearsay. It's declaration of an agent. Why should that be special? Because it's likely to be correct. Because what was counsel doing at the magistrate's court? Either counsel was writing down accurate instructions or counsel was misinterpreting the instructions, which can happen, or counsel was on a frolic of her own and just randomly making up defences, which I accept may be a better course of action in a lot of cases, but it's unlikely to be the case. The defence relied on an earlier case from a different age, 25 years ago, the case of Hutchinson. And Hutchinson was very similar, but different in some material aspects. Hutchinson concerned a declaration made on what was then a plea and directions hearing form, which was admitted at trial. What did the Court of Appeal say? The Court of Appeal said that the evidence was admissible, but that the evidence ought not to be admitted. Why? Well, it's not clear from the judgment as to why, but I think the reason is this. It wasn't thought worth it to salvage a case every now and again to sacrifice case management because the fear was that if what you wrote on the form might be admitted in evidence, no one would write on the form what was required. So it was probably a public policy decision by the judiciary. But the world's moved on. But how much? Because if you apply the overriding objective to first, and think about it for a moment. Firth was not at risk of conviction. No one actually suggested, although you couldn't have had the legal argument at committal stage, no one actually suggested that counsel and what she wrote was wrong. The only effect of committing the case was to keep the case moving because the defect would, and was in fact, cured pretty quickly. What's the alternative? Well, the alternative is to throw the case out but what would happen? Well, they cure the defect, summons the person, and start the procedure all over again. So which bit of the overriding objective is served by this? Have we convicted the guilty? Hmm. Have we acquitted the innocent? Well, we know what would have happened had it been thrown out. Did we deal with the case proportionately, expeditiously, with an eye on scarce public resources, would any of those objectives have been achieved by throwing the case out? The answer, as unpalatable though it might be to the old school thinking, was that it's incredibly difficult to come up with an argument as to how the overriding objective, as enunciated in the criminal procedure rules, would have been served one iota by throwing that case out at committal. It would have been a victory for the defence lawyer it would have been a victory for the defendant, but it would not have served the overriding objective, which is now part of the rule book. As sure as I'm standing here, it's only a matter of time before someone sitting in a magistrate's court on a wet Friday, the prosecution case falls short, and someone applies to admit the case management form in evidence. So we have a rerun of Hutchinson. The point is this, Firth has not overruled Hutchinson. We'll have to have 
the hard case to get the answer. I'm afraid we have to go through the pain of that wet Friday afternoon, the form going in and the case going to the Administrative Court. I personally would be astounded if the Administrative Court allowed in a form in a case where an issue had been properly identified as an issue in play at the case management hearing to cure a tardy prosecution case. I do not personally believe that is what the High Court would allow to happen. It is about case management. It is not about convicting at all costs. My view, therefore, is that Firth is an unfortunate diversion from the serious issues at play. Firth affords no defence whatsoever to not filling in the form. There's nothing at all. And certainly the judge in Firth makes explicit reference to the culture of case management having changed since 1986. But what about the level of detail required? We get an insight in some cases, including the case uh, of Malcolm from the 1st of September 2011. Malcolm was a straightforward case. Essentially, Malcolm had taken property from a flat and put it in his own flat. He had a number of different lines of defences. Some of the property I didn't nick in the first place. Some of the property I did take, but I wasn't dishonest because the letting agent told me I could have it. And the third line of defence, some other property I did take, I wasn't told I could have it, but I was going to give it back. So no intention to permanently deprive. The problem with number three was the property he was going to put back wasn't found because I think he'd flogged it on eBay. Okay? So it was a pretty hopeless defence, but nonetheless it didn't lack imagination. A, a very straightforward case. What would you expect to see in a defence statement? What might you expect, therefore, to see in a case management form? This is what the judiciary said in the case of Malcolm. It follows that the defence statement was hopelessly inadequate in light of the requirements. To satisfy the requirements, it was insufficient merely to say that the defendant did not accept that he took all the items being claimed by the complainant. The appellant was required to identify what was taken by him from the flat to identify those items said to be stolen which he'd left in the flat, i.e. what he hadn't taken. If he had taken, for example, the fridge, freezer and dishwasher, what had he done with them? If, as alleged, he did not intend permanently to deprive the owner of the items, what was his intention, particularly in relation to those items missing from the flat and not found in his own flat? If it was alleging, as he had in his prepared statement, that he'd been given permission by a female agent to take items from the flat, who had given them permission, when, in what circumstances. If he did not know her name, he should have identified her in some other way. For example, the female from the agency to which he'd gone and who'd showed him around the flat. To answer the statutory requirements, the appellant ought also to have explained whether he accepted the value of some 15 to 20,000 for the items taken and explained why, in his view, he was entitled to take the items which he did take. I think there would have been a clearer way to do this see attached proof of evidence might have just been a convenient short form for this. So you see here the level of particularity being demanded in relation to this. So this issue, lack of dishonesty, issue self-defence, is not going to be enough when filling in these forms. Other changes which we will see in relation to arguments about lack of disclosure and legal aid will come to in a moment. But what about putting the prosecution to proof. Is there an entitlement to witnesses if you're putting the prosecution to proof? <laughs> Let me give you the classic domestic violence case. Defendant assaults the victim and is arrested. Defendant makes no comment in interview. Defendant and victim reconcile. The victim does not wish to come to court to give evidence. The defendant admits to his solicitor that he carried out the assault and is advised to enter a not guilty plea in the hope that the victim will not turn up and the prosecution will fail to secure her attendance by compulsion. If she does turn up, of course he'll plead guilty. And that's the way it is. First question, is that a legitimate defence tactic? Seems to be. It's certainly a very common one. But enter now the overriding objective and what we can do evidentially. Ordinarily, section 114 of the 2003 Act is not to be used to circumvent the witness compulsion and absence requirements in section 116. But this isn't actually a section 116 situation. Having a witness turn up and give oral evidence is not the only way to prove a case 
in English courts. So what are the defence saying here? They're saying, I want someone to come to court, but are they advancing a defence? Well, they can't, can they? Because there isn't a defence to advance. So therefore, they have to sit on their hands. So looking at the overriding objective, bearing in mind not a single piece of their evidence is in dispute, how is the overriding objective served by requiring a witness to actually come through the door of the court? If you've not one single question to ask this person, why put them to the inconvenience of bringing them through the door of the court? Well, we could have three hours on that question alone, and it's one which is going to entertain the courts no end in the next 18 months or so. But prosecution coming up to proof on a case is not just achieved by oral evidence. The whole purpose of section 114 you remember this, the inclusionary rule of evidence based on the interests of justice. The interests of justice is perhaps just another way of saying the overriding objective. Seems to me 114 may well be an answer for that type of case. It's going to be a very interesting 18 months. There's been previously an adjournment culture. This is interesting because for many years now, the only way to make money in criminal defence has actually been to exit the case at the lowest profit costs. If you're getting a fixed fee, the less work you do, the bigger your profit margin is. So adjournments, despite what is said about them, is not normally in the defence lawyer's financial interest. But there are some frictions at play here. The first is legal aid or the delay in grant of legal aid sometimes said actually to be the fault of the defence. From the court's point of view, though, whilst there is very often expression of sympathy, particularly from district judges who had earned their money in the good old days of easier grant of legal aid, expressions of sympathy do not butter the parsnips, and they offer little else. The case will not be delayed for the grant of legal aid. The grant or otherwise of legal aid is, if you think about it, the lawyer's problem. It's not the defendant's problem necessarily, and it's not the court's problem necessarily. And this is what is said in the training package. Again, full marks for frankness, I think. Experience suggests that where the lawyer chooses to withdraw, so where the lawyer is saying, I can't progress this case, I need an adjournment for legal aid. And the court says, we're not having an adjournment, so are you staying or are you going? Matter for you. Okay? So if the lawyer withdraws and doesn't want to play ball anymore, they say this, the unrepresented defendant is often well able to enter a plea. Unrepresented defendants are common in the magistrate's court. Despite what many defence lawyers think, magistrates and particularly district judges are not scared of unrepresented defendants. I dare say they would sooner not have them, but perhaps they would sooner have them than some defence lawyers, perhaps. The next problem is disclosure or the apparent lack of of disclosure. I say apparent lack of disclosure because what the defence are really trying to achieve is to see whether the prosecution can prove the case. Does it come up to muster? Well, that's not really about the overriding objective. The issue is, can the defendant, whether through defence lawyer or himself, identify the real issues in the case to bring the case on? Adjournments to view CCTV. Again, falls outside of disclosure requirements. There is no duty under the criminal procedure rules to disclose evidence. There is only actually an obligation to disclose either the evidence, documents on which the prosecution rely, or a summary of the case. And it is doubtful in any event whether a CCTV video is a document. But in fact, it's an argument which we don't really need to have now. A germ for the defendant to receive a police caution and the favourite, time to take instructions. That's an adjournment that will be granted. If you want time to take instructions, Mr Keogh, I'll see you at 2 o'clock. That's the adjournment you will get in the future. But perhaps the major one is trial or committal readiness. And I think this has been the greatest grievance of defence lawyers. The main complaint over the years has been an inconsistent approach to case management. And I don't think many people will be able to refute that. And the perception, whether true or not, but my personal view is that there's more truth in it than not, is that case management is not applied even-handedly between prosecution and defence. The prosecution seems to be excused delay in the process where the defence are not. It is an interesting approach in the package, 
because the package of training seems to offer up an even-handed approach. The trial will be the trial. The committal will be the committal. Some of you have heard that before, not once, not twice, maybe even three or four times over the years. This again is what the training package says. In the scenario shown on the DVD, the failure to warn the witnesses well in advance resulted at the very least in significant delay in bringing the officer's difficulties to the attention of the court. In this case, the defendant has made it clear what the issues were and would have been expecting the trial to proceed. It is unacceptable that the officer was not warned sooner, which might have resulted in an early application to vacate and a much shorter delay in bringing the case to conclusion. Looking at the overriding objective, taking account of all the factors included in Part 1.2, applying the factors set out in the case of Picton, refusing the application for an adjournment is most consistent with dealing with the case justly. So ironically, the fair application of these rules may further the client's overriding objective much further and much more than many defence lawyers would at first blush believe. As far as ambush defences are concerned, the position is very, very clear. If positions are not made clear at the first hearing and issues arise later, there probably will be an adjournment for the prosecution to cure the defect and there probably will be <coughs> resulting wasted costs order. So to sum up, where are we now in the process? I think there are seven propositions. In my view, the rules are not only clear, they are crystal clear. A line has been drawn under past conduct. You'll be forgiven your sins. A date has been set for the new rules to be enforced, but watch out. The initiative may fail, but it won't fail through lack of effort. Ironically, the CPS is much more under-resourced than the defence. And my view is that they will struggle to come up to the plate on case management. If the defence wish to see the benefits of case management, then the defence will have to play nicely with the referee. I think it will produce significant benefits for the defence who play nicely. There are three enforcement tools available to the judge or magistrate. First, wasted costs. Wasted costs generally are things we've shied away from. Why? Well, we've sort of reached a gentleman's agreement with the prosecution not to bother. You know what it's like. You go out to court, you're steaming, you're going to judicial review everybody, you know, but you never do. Okay? Three hours later, you've calmed down. And that's why most people put wasted costs off into the long grass. But this is something, of course, which is not only at the invitation of parties, can also be imposed by the judge. The second, the refusal of an adjournment or an application, an application to adjourn trial, a committal, an application to reduce evidence late, particularly bad character or hearsay. And finally, what I would describe as a nuclear option, which is professional conduct sanctions. This is interesting because I can find no example whatsoever of this ever being used against a solicitor. But if you do a search on the Bar Standards Board website, you'll actually find a number of recent examples of Crown Court judges reporting barristers for breach of case management obligations in the Crown Court. So it is available and it's being used. If this is not enforced and complied with, then on one day, one judge will decide to make an issue. There will be a scalp. There will be a solicitor before long, on the front page of the Gazette, on a Thursday morning, who's been brought to book for breach of criminal procedure rules. This is not a novel concept. The warning was set out very clearly early on in Gleeson. You take a real risk in playing games. Last, there are no arguments, as far as I can identify, which are on the table to counter the approach of the criminal procedure rules and the cases which have come from the High Court and the Court of Appeal. Not, none at all. There's lots of hissy fits, but there's actually no argument on the table to defeat the new world order. To say that war has been declared on the reluctant advocate is perhaps something of an exaggeration. But life in the criminal courts, and in particular the magistrates' courts, 
Well, don't forget, approximately 95% of litigation is concluded, is about to change, and dramatically so. The death warrant for the clever technical lawyer was signed some years ago. It has now finally been executed. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Any questions?